Today's message, we're going to jump right into the text, uh, Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 17 down to 36, reading from the New International Version. And what I'd like to do is just start off with that because sometimes when we go through the text line by line, uh, especially if it's a longer text, you can kind of lose the forest for the trees. So we're going to go through, then we're going to come back <clears throat> to the start, go through it with a bit more detail, and look at for some applications to our lives today. So beginning chapter 6. Verse 17, he, Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a story, an ancient folk tale about two brothers, and they worked on the same farm, and they shared all the work equally, and they split the profits right down the middle. So they worked on this same farm, but they lived in separate houses, you know, on the same property, separate houses. They had their own, you know, granaries, their own barns. And so they worked away and they split the profits, but the one brother had a wife and children and the other brother uh, lived by himself. He was single. So they're working away and they're splitting all the profits. And at the end of the, one of the days, the brother who uh, is single says to himself, this isn't fair. We're splitting these profits right down the middle and I've only got to feed myself, but my brother's got this wife and these kids to care for. And so he should really be getting more of the grain. And so what he decided to do is under the cover of night, he gets this big sack of grain and secretly he goes and he puts it in the other granary. And he does that because he's like, that, that way I'll slowly be able to get my brother to have more grain, right? But he won't know it. And so this is what he does. He goes and puts it in his other, uh, other grain. But little does he know at the same time that his brother over here in the house, he's there thinking, you know, I, this isn't fair. I don't think this is fair either. I've got, you know, as I get older, my, my own family, they're going to be able to help care for me and provide for me, but my brother doesn't have that. And so what are they, I, I need to give him some more grain so that he can store it up. And so that when he's older, he'll have more, you know, and that'll help, you know, provide for him. And so with the brothers, each were doing this under the cover of night, taking sacks of grain to each, each other's granary. And, and every morning, each of them would get up, not knowing what the other was doing and realize, wait a second, this is crazy. I, I, I still have the same amount of grain that I did as for the previous night. And so it was this mystery to them. Anyway, one day, of course, it was inevitable. It goes to happen and they're walking and they're carrying these sacks of grain to each other's, you know, barns and they meet each other in the night. 
They meet each other there, and of course, they, they, they lock eyes, they realize what's going on, and they drop their sacks of grain, and they embrace. They realize what the other is doing for the other. Luke six thirty one. do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, when we hear a story like that, you know, what's our response? Well, uh, my first response when I heard that story was just like inspired. It was really inspiring. It was really nice. That's amazing. Love one another, uh, you know, and, and treat each other as you would want to be treated. That's really great. But another part of me had this reaction. What about those times when we feel like we don't do that? We know that we are called to live out this high ethical calling due to others as you would have them do to you, Luke 6, 31. But what happens when we don't do that? What happens when we are in a difficult chapter of our lives? And what's happening is we just, we just don't feel like we're able to, to do it. Instead of thriving, we feel like we're just trying to keep you know, the train on the tracks. We're just trying to survive. What, what have, is there a place in God's kingdom for us when we feel like we're failing when it comes to our discipleship and we're somehow missing the mark? Well, this is the question that we are going to try to explore today in this scripture from Luke 6. Okay, so we're going to go through it, and we're going to look at the text, look at some of the detail, try some, find some applications directly for our lives, and seek to answer that question. Okay, so uh, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. As I mentioned, we are going through line by line uh, some of these stories, beginning at verse 17. You'll recall that Luke's gospel is one of the four gospels. Uh, it, although it doesn't have a date in it, we can assume that it was written, an educated guess would be around the year 70. And Luke was the uh, doctor and co-worker of the apostle Paul. And so he sets, to, you know, finding eyewitness testimony, uh, making an orderly account. He's paying attention to details, as he himself tells us in chapter 1. And he puts all these things together, and each of the Gospels kind of have a bit of a different emphasis. And Luke's emphasis is, is stressing the fact that Jesus is Savior to all people. Right, so he's got this broad-based appeal, um, people even who don't have a religious background, and some people who might otherwise be considered as outcasts. Okay? And so Jesus here, we're, we're picking up the story. He's starting to do these incredible things. His influence and authority, uh, is popularity is ballooning. He's been performing exorcisms. He's been performing miracles, teaching with authority. People are uh, being attracted around him. Verse 17, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. This is evil, demonic spirits. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Pause. Okay, so here we'll pause this for a second. What we, what we need to be noticing here, one of the details we can focus on is the fact that there's a lot of people coming, uh, not only from Judea and Jerusalem, which would have been considered kind of traditional Jewish uh, areas where people would have lived, but also uh, the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. So this was an area beyond what would be considered normal Jewish territory. So again, this detail is included, and we are reminded of the fact of this broad-based, wide appeal of Jesus for all people. Verse 20, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Pause. Okay, so all of a sudden we get into a section of blessings, and for those of you who are familiar with your Bibles, this will sound an awful lot like another part of the Bible, uh, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes in Matthew, starting at chapter 5. Um, although, although there are similarities, there are also significant differences. Um, preachers then, preachers now sometimes use similar material in different contexts, and I think that is what's happening here. So it says, blessed are you who are poor. So what does it mean to be blessed? Well, blessed is one of those words that we use a lot, and um, we kind of know what it means, but it's hard to define. So we need to think about it. So, you know, to be blessed really means to receive a favor from God. God's good to us. And we receive a favor from God. That's what it means to be blessed. And I think we still know this, like on a subconscious level. You'll have a great Thanksgiving meal. You'll connect with awesome friends all night. And uh, you think, oh, you'll say or post something, hashtag blessed, right? We, we've received some sort of gift from God in this. Well, what's radical about this is Jesus looks out upon these people and says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. You. Now, as he goes about describing how these certain groups of people are blessed, we need to keep in mind that the present tense is used, and he's most likely describing situations that they are already in. He's speaking to people who are poor, who are hungry, who are weeping, who are experienced hatred in the world. And so we can assume that's also the case. Where some of them, their, their tummies are grumbling. They are poor. Now, does that mean that 
everyone who is poor is blessed as a part of the kingdom of God, even if they don't believe in God and could care less what God thinks. Well, I don't think that's the implication. Uh, I think really what is here in view is the pious poor. Those who are faithful, those who are seeking to, to be reliant on God, but still struggle to pay the bills and struggle to put three meals on uh, the table each day. Yours is the kingdom of God. Okay, yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. I love this. Now, Jesus, you know, they're walking with the Savior, God in human form. And so even though they've got some of these struggles and these challenges in their life, they will find great satisfaction and fulfillment as they walk along and journey uh, through life with him. Not only eternally in the big picture, but Jesus is also going to satisfy their physical needs while he's with them. And Luke 9 tells us that, right? In the city of Bethsaida, he feeds the 5,000. So, you know, tummy, rumbling, pacified. I love this. Uh, the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon preaching in the 1800s, and I'm paraphrasing here, but on this sermon on the sufficiency of Jesus and how he, he just so satisfies us um, and how he's sufficient. Uh, he, he says, you know, even an emperor who doesn't have Christ is poorer than a beggar who does have Christ. I love that. So they are totally satisfied in him. Blessed are you, the kingdom of God, where God reigns and rules with his truth and holiness and justice and compassion and love is yours. You will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Wow. Okay, pause. So they're going to experience this, this hate, this exclusion, insults, rejection because of the Son of Man. So remember that the Son of Man is the title that Jesus most frequently uses for himself. So because they are loyal to and align themselves with Jesus, others will hate and reject them. And so what happens? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Huh? Because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Pause. That is not the first thing we might expect them to do. Don't you think they'd kind of mope around and lick their wounds and maybe, you know, you know conjure up some vitriol to spew at someone online or social media or something? No. It says rejoice. For your reward is great in heaven. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Pause. Okay, so all of a sudden, the tone changes in quite dramatically. He's been talking about blessings on a certain group of people, and now he is talking about woes. Well, what is a woe? So clearly it's not good. Again, one of those things that's hard to define. What is a woe? Uh, one uh, Greek lexicon that I consulted um, suggested its meaning was close to horror or a warning, right? If someone says, woe to you for doing such and such a thing, oh, it's clearly a bad thing. And so Jesus is offering a very serious and significant warning. Woe, horror is coming for those who are like this, okay? Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. So just as I don't think Jesus was previously saying that all poor, regardless of faith, uh, that the kingdom of God was, was upon them. I also don't think this is a broad-based condemnation of uh, having money. However, we are seriously warned about the perils of money in various places. So the start of 2019, I did a sermon series called Heaven and Hell. In preparation for that, I went through the, the New Testament again. I was going and studying different passages. Other than blatant unbelief, the greatest two barriers to genuine faith in God and therefore heaven were one, having a spirit of unforgiveness. Second was money. Money can be this thing where that becomes our source of comfort. That becomes our source of security. That becomes our source of hope. It becomes this false idol or can be that we serve and orient the priorities of our life around protecting that, around serving that, around doing that to the neglect of God, to the neglect of other priorities and relationships around us that we should be paying attention to. And so clearly, that's who's in view in this passage because he says, well, you've received your comfort. It's misplaced comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will be hungry. See, the rich are self-satisfied, not God-satisfied. There's a world of difference between being self-satisfied and God-satisfied. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and leap. Woe to, to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. So here we get the sense that there, some people are, are, are just so giddy 
with their own self-importance, with their own self-satisfaction, right? And woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. So this isn't a a condemnation of, of when someone pays you a compliment. What really here the context is suggesting is saying that, you know what, when you are so concerned with just what other people say and think, and you just want to appease and get them to say nice things about you, and you neglect what God thinks and, and, and what God is doing in your life and what he demands of us, horror is coming in those situations. Now, a high-level comment on this um, at the end of the woe section. I think high-level, what we're seeing in both the blessings and woes is that blessings are upon those who are God-reliant, horror or woe for those who are self-reliant. Continuing verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Wow, pause. So we just got to pause on how countercultural. This love is that is so, so radical. When people do these things to us that are described, our first instinct is maybe to retaliate. All right, retaliate. But what Jesus is saying here is no, retaliate, but retaliate with grace, with, with love. We also need to think of what it means to love here. Because I worry that the word love, at least in its biblical sense today, has almost been virtually totally drained uh, of its wider and deeper biblical meaning. So to love someone in the biblical sense, I think, when you look at the passages, means we acknowledge that other people are made in the image of God. And because everyone is made in the image of God, Genesis 1, they are due respect. Um, They have dignity and value within them because they're made in the image of their creator. And also that we seek God's best for them. We want to seek God's best for those people. That's what it means to love someone. And quite often this kind of love, as it is expressed in the New Testament, has a self-sacrificial quality to it as well. That's what it means. And Jesus is so inspiring, amazing, incredible, because as we've been saying, as he talks and shows what the kingdom of God is like, he talks the talk and then walks the walk. And this is also true here, right? He's saying, love your enemies. Well, what happens later on in the story? I think it's one of the most amazing, if not the most amazing example of this ever in the history of humanity is he goes to the cross, he's getting crucified, and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He does all this stuff in, in one sentence. He, cr- he, for- he asks his heavenly father to forgive them while they're crucifying him, while blood is gushing down his body. Verse 29, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them. The other also, if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Pause. So you'll notice that the central line in there was verse 31, do to others as you would have them do to you. And so that's a commentary not only on what he has just said in the previous verses, but also on the verses that follow. Do to others. And we're going to reflect on that again shortly. Uh, Also notice that he says the word sinners a lot. Don't sinners just do all these other things? Well, of course, we are all sinners, As Paul famously reminds us in Romans 3.23, you've all sinned and fallen short of the the glory of God. But here, sinners is used in a broader sense, meaning people who could care less about what God thinks or God's ways. So he's just saying we should be distinctive. We should be living according to this higher ethical calling. We should be distinctive in the kind of love that we share so generously. Verse 35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the most high, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Pause. Children of the Most High. Well, they're already children of God. However, when we are children of the Most High, what he's saying is you will be acting in a way that is consistent with being children of the Most High. Jesus is the capital S Son of the Most High, as we've already learned twice in chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel. And so when we act that way, we are taking on the family trait, the family characteristics of our older brother and King Jesus, and also as a way that is consistent with our Heavenly Father. Uh, Fred Craddock has a great comment on this. He's a professor, and he says, you know, one's lifestyle is not determined by the enemy. 
I love that. One's lifestyle is not determined by the enemy. So if we're just retaliating and getting sucked into a certain way of living that is unbecoming of who we are summoned to be in the footsteps of Jesus, we're letting the enemy set the agenda. And so Jesus is saying, don't do that. And the final verse, verse 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. I love that. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So we're going to end the text there. And I'd like us to bring into focus three thrusts of this. And here's the first. God's blessing is upon those who are God-reliant. Horror will come on those who are self-reliant. Meaning self-reliant people, those who just totally cast aside and reject God. And, and this can seem like a harsh word, but I think it needs to be said because I believe that Jesus consistently teaches this. Now, this is a hard message to hear also here in North America. Highly individualistic, highly me first, self-reliant is good, you know, self-starter, you know, you independent, all these things. And I realize what that means in a certain context, but we can't fall victim to the deception that we can do all these things and totally reject that God is the source of all truth, hope, security in our lives. God's blessing is upon those who are God-reliant. Horror will come on those who are self-reliant. And this cuts across, as we have seen, social, economic background, all that. Number two, we are called to a high ethical standard in the footsteps of Jesus. We are called. We need to acknowledge that. Do to others as you would have them do to you. We retaliate, but we retaliate with grace. Now, this passage is one of the most famous things that Jesus has ever said. It's right up there with love your neighbor as yourself. Um, but what happens with this verse is we can almost trivialize it. And we can think, oh, it just means being nice. And we should be nice. That's good. But think about it. The details matter. Think about what this means, okay? Think about some of the implications. How would you want to be treated by someone? Let me suggest four things. Um, you, you want people to respect your opinion, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that you, um, you, you, you don't want people to assume that you've got bad motives all the time. Um, three, you want people to be honest with you, but you want them to be honest in a way that is sensitive to your situation. Um, four, when you're down, you want people to give you a helping hand. And so if that's the kinds of things that we appreciate when people extend them to us, then proactively, Jesus says, that is how we are to interact with others, even enemies. And then three, Jesus does for you what you can't do for yourself. And friends, this is just something we need to know and remember. Lord, th thank you for this incredible gift. Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And this is where we tie back to that story that we started with, with the two brothers and the grains of sack and such a great demonstration of Luke 6.31 due to others. So it's inspiring, but at the same time, there are times when we feel like we don't do it. We can't do it. We feel like we falter and we fail when we, we don't achieve this high ethical standard. Well, part of my job here today is to say that Jesus does for you what you can't do for yourself. And you look through the gospel story and the disciples, and we talked about Peter last week, is sometimes he gets it, sometimes he doesn't. And they have this stumbling obedience in the footsteps of Jesus. But guess what? He still loves them. We follow Jesus faithfully, not perfectly. And the story goes on, and we hear all these stories, and we're going to explore many of them over the, in the next several months. And then at the Last Supper, Jesus takes the bread, breaks it. This is my body broken for you. Jesus goes to the cross for them. He gives his life for theirs, not because they're perfect, but because he loves them. And so there are times when we miss the mark. And we need to remember that, you know, Central to the Christian gospel is it's all about how good Jesus is, not how good we are. Are we called to live according to a high ethical standard? Absolutely. Do we need to try each and every day relying on God's help? Absolutely. But what makes us right with God isn't how morally well you perform. It's what Jesus has given to us. And that is central to the gospel. It is such, such good news. It's not based on how good we are, but how good Jesus is. So for a final, final thought this morning, I want to show you a poem. It's called Footprints or Footprints in the Sand. It's a very famous poem. And some of you will have this on a plaque like this. Uh, this is a plaque that Jen brought in, asked her to bring this in. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I think growing up, we maybe had this on, on our wall. I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to do that because I think this poem gives us kind of a good lens to look at what we've been talking about in three different ways. Okay. 
Um, let me read it to you. And I, I, I looked online who, tri- who authored this. There seemed to be some competing claims, so I can't totally uh, credit that. Uh, one night a man dreamed he was walking alongside the beach with the Lord. As scenes of his life flashed before him, he noticed that there were two sets of footprints in the sand. He also noticed at his saddest, lowest times, there was one set of footprints. This bothered the man, and he asked the Lord, Did you not promise that if I gave my heart to you, that you'd be with me all the way? Then why is there only one set of footprints during my most troublesome times? The Lord replied, My precious child, I love you and would never forsake you. During those times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Now, so beautiful, of course, we love that poem, don't we? It's a, such a reminder of so many great you know, biblical truths. So the first way I want us to reflect on that is this idea of just footprints in terms of discipleship. We are following Jesus. So if we see one set of footprints in the sand, that's kind of a metaphor for you know Jesus is leading the way. And he sets this high ethical standard, and we are trying to walk in the manner of his life, follow in his footsteps, right? So that's one way. Uh, the second is the intent that I think is, you know, native to the poem. The idea that when we're sad or when we're struggling, you know, uh, the Lord picks us up in his arms then and carries us forward. And I get the sense of Deuteronomy, you know, underneath, underneath of the everlasting arms, that great passage. But a third way is also a great possibility and promise and I think hope and encouragement to us to, to interpret this. We can think of it like this, is that one set of footprints means he carries you not only when you fall, but when you fail. Not only when you fall out of sadness or whatever, but when you fail, when you feel like you can't do it. And I think this is just as your pastor, I think this is a message a lot of us need to hear right now because some of us don't feel very great about our discipleship. You know, forget about thriving. We're just trying to surviving, just keep the train on the tracks. You know, you know, there's so much craziness going on and people are struggling. And maybe you feel bad about your discipleship right now. I'm just telling you that this is a chapter where, you know what, maybe there's one set of footprints, not only for when you fall, but for when you fail. And the Lord is doing for you in this time what you cannot do for yourself. And so let me just read those last couple lines again with that in mind. Why is there only one set of footprints during my most troublesome times? The Lord replied, my precious child, I love you and would never forsake you. During those times when you have failed and you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Amen.